So, Storchum Prison. Acclaimed as the world's most humane prison. There's not a lot of prisons that are competing for that title, but we'll hear a bit more about that in a second. Um, MailOnline.com, which I'm sure you're all keen followers of. Um, surprisingly, not, not one of its more bitter pieces, but they did do a big article on, on Storchum Prison, uh, and they talked about it as a luxury lockup. Uh, and they, um, they asked a slightly sneering question, is this a college or a jail? Uh, and they asked that in such a way that you wondered, well, what's, what's wrong with being a college? But they seem to think that a place that you might learn and benefit from was you know, a bit suspicious. Uh, but I don't think we do. I think we think clearly there's maybe a lot we could benefit from improving uh, prisons. And clearly, um, you know, Dan Danish prisons seem to have a, a much lower recidiv recidivism rate than the British prisons. So perhaps there are things to learn. So the way we're structured this evening is a really insightful view from, from Mads and Marianne, the designers uh, connected with the prison. Uh, and then we've got Peter Dawson from the Prison Reform Trust to try and give us a bit more of a UK context, what we might learn from this, what we are doing here, uh, the kind of questions around prisons. Uh, and there's a, it's not just about design, it's about the whole sort of ethics around, around, uh, around what we're doing with prisons. So it could be a very interesting discussion, I think. Um, so welcome you to to engage with that discussion after the presentations. And we'll take the questions all at the end. So let me just give a little bit of introduction to our first speaker. I'll, I'll introduce each speaker as we go along. Uh, and Mads um, Mandrup Hansen, the project architect at CF Muller, who worked on this prison, led, led the work on this prison. He's our first speaker. And uh, Mads is quite a, quite a uh, you know, worked on a lot of notable projects with CF Muller. Um, so working with his partner colleague, Luna Vigas, is that pronounced correctly? Vigas or Vigas? Yeah. Um, he's led a team of 70 or more architects, which is part of the overall CF Muller's 430 um, uh, uh, staff. Uh, and he has other roles, he's, other, other projects he's worked on include the concept be behind the new headquarters at Carlsberg, um, currently being realized, uh, the future Surland, which is going to become a place which gathers several generations under one roof, including a care facility for the elderly and accommodations for the young and the kindergartens. That's a very interesting, uh, another sort of social experiment of a kind. Um, perhaps experiment isn't, isn't the right word, but certainly a socially adventurous approach. Uh, he's been in charge of the new landmark for Copenhagen, the Mesk Tower, um, which is for the Fac Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at Copenhagen University. Uh, it's also designed the newly opened Copenhagen International School in Copenhagen's new uh, harbour district of Nordhaven. Um, he's also left his architectural mark on buildings in Sweden and Norway, but with major projects in both Stockholm and Oslo. So a really broad range of work, uh, and this project, um, uh, I'm sure, has benefited from, from that sort of you know, wide perspective, and maybe that's, that's why we're seeing a very interesting and original uh, approach here. So really, my welcome to Mads. Thank you very much for coming over to Copenhagen, and tell us more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for coming here. Uh, it's been, I'm happy here to, to talk a bit about the prison, but I think before I do that, as the great introduction here in terms of to work with a special thing like a prison um, and to understand the well-being and the thing working with healing architecture and so forth, I think you have to kind of also understand the, the kind of cultural background that architects are, are sort of based on uh, or in. Um, so to understand the project, you really have to understand who we are. So I'll do a little short introduction. Apart from these amazing projects you were explaining here early on, I think it's also important to understand that when you come from Scandinavia, of course, we are being very close, England and, and Scandinavia, but even so, there's a sort of a big divide, I think, in terms of how we go about doing projects for, for the common good. Not saying that you don't do things for the common good, but I think the Scandinavian model, at least, is very much founded in the idea, the perception of, of, of really heavy involvement all the way around in society. So in a sense, architects in Denmark in, in general are actually sort of rounded by, by the fact that they've sort of been helping to, to build the realization of the welfare state for, for, for many decades. And our company um, is basically based in several offices around Scandinavia. We, um, we are basically standing on, on the 
on the shoulders of, of building for nine decades. We've been doing welfare uh, projects. And uh, we've been doing everything from healthcare within the, the backbone of the welfare state, physical framework as we know it, and this strong link between heavy involvement um, in the public sector and the profession of, of architects and so forth, we believe that this is the driving force behind doing holistic design. And I think we've been doing this even before we, we sort of could put it on paper and say there was such a thing as, as healing or well-being architecture and putting into it this evidence-based uh, sort of toolbox. I think we've been doing this ever since the, the welfare state started for, let's say, 50, 60 70 years ago, and um, it's also influenced the way that the provision, uh, not alone, but an ongoing and never stopping process through demands for a de democratic user process. So the users, not in the jail necessarily, because there, of course, you have the, the, the challenge in terms of the people that are going in. You don't know the users before they go in. But however, a lot of these projects that our office has been involved with has been the entire spectrum of doing hospitals, schools, universities, research projects, and so forth. So they are constantly pushing the limits of how architecture um, moves forward. And because of this user uh, involvement within the last 78 years as we've been doing these projects, slowly but steadily, we sort of come into this sort of self-initiating, um, doing things better and better and, and sort of improving things. For at least C.F. Muller, this has formed our core values of functional architecture, uh, executing in a rational, clear language uh, in a strong dialogue with its context. And I'll come back to this with context, but they define our architecture till this day today and still influencing the way we work. And our probably most known project, Aarhus University, and the reason I bring this, there are some resemblances. You will see this later on when I show uh, pictures from the jail or the prison that we've done at Storstrøm. Uh, in our opinion, is still a, is a great example of the Nordic architecture approach. It's based on a series of simple yellow brick buildings arranged in a landscape defining what has become one of the most renowned references of blending natural landscape and modern functionalism in Danish architecture, and probably to this day today, still the benchmark for what we do. But it's also a project that we branched out from, and within the public sector from hospitals, to the educational sector, as I mentioned, and back over to the private sector doing projects uh, today. So we span the whole spectrum. And what's interesting with all these projects is that they all incorporate healing aspects, even before the term was, as I said, invented, helping us to spearhead our office into healing architecture adapted to Nordic values and efficient care for the mind and soul and architecture with a social purpose. We have a slogan we call happy people in healthy architecture. And I think that should really be the title for doing this, uh, of explaining the prison and the concept behind it and the thinking behind it. So today we put in a lot of this into the methodical way of also doing other projects. We moved on to doing hospitals here. You see a few examples of some of our new projects. And as that was mentioned by Louis uh, early on um, in the introduction, we also moving over into using architecture in new ways of programming our cities here from this uh, elderly people's home, but it's actually a, a place where you have different generations under one roof. There's both for the young and kindergarten and so forth. So this thing, our idea of mixing the urban realm with all new ways of putting people together, this sort of um, engineering with people and the way we program our buildings, I think is really important to understand that these are things that we, we brought to the table when we did the prison. And with this unprecedented investment um, into doing um, healing architecture, you could say that this has been an ongoing process. But something happened here within the last 10 years when the economy internationally sort of went steep down. And I think here in England, where we have our office too, we experienced how everything stopped uh, overnight. Um, 10 years ago, the Danish state because of the high taxes and so forth, had set money aside, and they reinvested into the doing what I would call the welfare phase part two. And this was uh, one of the reasons that this whole sort of reinvestment in doing a lot of uh, state-funded project was also the focus of the contribution by the Danish Biennale at the, uh, in Venice, showcased a magnitude of projects fueled by the relation between buildings, 
urban settings, all based on the common goal of creating ways of strengthening a variety of purpose-driven solutions, but all with the common goal of incorporating society and healthy, sustainable solutions. In a sense, you could say they brought it to the next level. So what I'm trying to say here is that we, for many decades, we've been working within the welfare system, but within the last 10 years, because of the challenges that modern society are facing and the growth in, in terms of population, but also the shift in the demographics, things, and of course, also things have sort of a certain lifespan. We are coming to a need of doing more efficient ways of doing these buildings, and I'll come back to that aspect in terms of the prison. There's been this whole sort of uh, reinvestment into this, and I, I think it's fair to say that uh, what we are experiencing in Scandinavia, at least in Denmark, is that this has really been where the focus for many architects have been. Of course, the private sector has now come afterwards again, so now there's sort of a, f a full move on within building throughout Scandinavia. We can definitely experience that, that there's a strong focus on, on this. But how should a prison design um, go about and, and deal with these things? Have they really been part of this? Well, if you look at uh, the development, as I mentioned early on within uh, the health sector, of course, there's this second move and second wave. But the prison has basically been standing still. Um, it seemed like every time there was a budget or an investment, this has kind of been lacking behind. Um, not the thinking behind the prison system, but its physical framework had kind of been standing still. So the prison that we are doing now is actually a replacement of a 150 years old prison. And that kind of gives you an idea of that, that the welfare state as we know it uh, is actually a bit appalling. This is what we've been giving, uh, or at least uh, this is where a lot of the, the, uh, the prisons have been, been, been uh, been staying for, for a long time. And the whole balance between uh, the public perception of, of the prison, what is that? Before we started this uh, um, journey here, you could see that this is uh, the plan and uh, the balance between uh, redemption and, and, and punishment. These are sort of uh, some famous uh, uh, photographs of that. But what if architecture could be different than just based on the panopticon? Well, during this journey, when we put together a team, and uh, this is about 10 years ago when we won the competition. We put together not just architects, we had Mariana Levinson who was doing the landscape, but we also brought on board a team where we had artists, we had uh, people working with color coordination and so forth. So we put together a, basically a task force of specialists. And we even also went out and interviewed people that worked within the, the, uh, the prison system. And uh, one guy that we really got close to, to gave us some truths about what the effect of the sort of static environment of a prison would have or the impact was a minister uh, working in one of the prisons said that when you have a panopticon, you could take any sort of hardened criminal and put him into a, a panopticon where he's constantly surveilled and within four or five years, that person will kind of, instead of rehabilitating the person, you would actually kind of bring down uh, the psychic of a person. So in a sense, the layout of a prison to do this is really important. Try to annihilate or at least erase this whole static environment. Try to come up with something that is not as stiff and not as focused just on staff and their way of surveilling, but try to see if you can blend these two things. So the background for, for, for doing the prison, as I was mentioning, is that nothing had really happened for many years within the prison system. However, there were a few attempts. And uh, we are not the first in these 50 years. There was a second one built. Um, it's, of course, important to say that this prison has to adapt to, to also the changing behavior of, of the criminal uh, um, environment. Um, this is a high security prison. It's not a, your standard prison. That's why also we said this is the probably one of the more human uh, of the version of doing, doing a high security prison, but it has to really sort of mirror the, 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 the fact that a lot of people going into prisons today from, from, um, from society is, is changed a lot. It it's, has to reflect on the fact that it's people with a, a background that is um, from the cities, a lot of it, but there's also a lot of things you have to fight in prisons today. That, Drugs, for instance, for 20 years ago weren't really something that you were faced with in Danish prisons. Now it's being a big problem. And it's also not just addressing uh, doing prisons where, where, where you, you have the families and so forth, also have to cater towards them so they can come and visit. So it's even bringing people together within the prison 
but it's also to go in and do um, a job where, where you, you do it better than, than, than what the previous prison was. This prison here was the first one that was done in 2006. It's, um, it was an attempt to, to, to do a prison based on a village concept. Um, the problem with this prison was that once it was, uh, this was not done by us, but this was done by, by other architects, was that this prison was basically based on the village concept where you have spread out uh, um, wings, uh, different parts of the prison was, uh, as you can see here, they were sort of put out here and then you had a main building over here. So the staff and the inmates were basically separated and there was not really any gravity towards the center except a landscape in the middle. Um, so when it came to our chance to participate in this competition here back in, uh, in uh, 2010, the Denmark decided they wanted two high security prisons, one here in the East Jutland, that's the one you saw before, and the new one that we are involved with is the state prison uh, that we put here down towards Falster, which is on an island away from Copenhagen, and we were replacing the old prison you saw before. Um, this prison here and, and this place down here was also for political reasons. They want to move it out here, not to isolate the, the inmates, but really to create a prison that could also support this very sort of poor rural area of Denmark. This is a place where there's a lot of in unemployment and so forth. So they really, from a political point of view, they want to put the prison out there too, to provide jobs for, for people that could work in the prison. So it's it sort of worked two, two ways. And when you see it from from the air here, you can see that we are placed in a very sort of flat uh, area close to the water and store storm, by the way, the name of the prison means that the sort of the, the, the inlet here of water running through here um, is the name that's given to it. They didn't want it to be called Falster, which is the uh, island that it's placed on. They wanted it to be given a more neutral uh, um, a name, so that's where store storm came in. But the thinking from our uh, perspective was to do a prison that blended really well into the surroundings. And if you fly over the area, as you could see before Google Earth here, you can see the villages are sort of predominating very small sizes. We could see suddenly that by articulating our prison to fit into the surroundings, Mariana will talk a little bit more about that later on, we try to sort of mirror some of the sort of recognizable patterns of the area. But it also turned out to be a very good way of organizing the prison in terms of making it a more humane and a much more um, um, interesting space. And, and as you can see here, we sort of articulate it in the landscape as a low structure. It's only two stories tall. So everything within and behind the walls is consisting of, of lower buildings. And uh, we start on with a very sort of uh, I would call it a very sort of romantic notion that we could introduce a lot of things that could help in terms of resocializing uh, uh, things such as putting livestock and having lots of trees and so forth. We'll get into that a little later on, but they were, we were challenged in terms of doing that, but we did get away with, this, with some of it. But the concept in, in, in generally was to do this village-like structure. And the, the thing is you have units, sort of prisons within the system where the inmates, they live in these, uh, different uh, units here, sort of prisons within the prisons. And then we have an extraordinary, uh, very secure department down here for the negative, very strong prisoners. So there was a segregation, but there was also a belief that we could create this city where people could connect and they could sort of have daily lives. We really wanted to do an architecture which was capable of mirroring where you came from. This was a thing that we really felt was important that the static environment of prisons shouldn't be what you saw, you should experience what you came from. We want to create a normalcy inside the prison. So therefore the architecture and the way we did the layout was basically formed and orchestrated after the, the need of trying to create an intimacy fitted for not just groups, but even individuals, the, the actual prisoner, him or herself, and we also realized that once we studied the movement within a prison system, how you, on a daily uh, way you move around, it was also important for us to use the congestion and radiate in towards the gravity, towards the middle of a village center to create this intimacy. It was also possible for us to create kind of a feeling that you weren't dissolute uh, in a city that was all empty. By compressing everything, there would be such more, more of an intimacy, just like walking in the streets of London in the narrow uh, side streets and so forth. And the vocabulary of the architecture, I'll show you this in a, in a minute, 
but it's also important for us to use it in a way that we used things that you came from. We really wanted it to be so you had a recognizable experience those 10, 15 years you were, you were in the prison. And so in general, we went in and decided to do a better version of the one that was done in 2006. Um, and the reason for, for changing that was not just from the perspective of the inmates, it was also from the perspective of the staff. And when you do a prison, it's very important that to get a good relation in terms of the whole process of educating people while they're there, giving them a meaningful daily lives, and the whole sort of relation between staff and, and inmates um, is very important. And what we, we learned through the process once we won the competition in dialogue with the client was that the reason they didn't really, this wasn't successful was that it was segregating. And suddenly you had sort of different strategies or paradigms within the prison and people were sort of operating on their own, uh, in their own separate worlds. So by congesting things, we weren't really just focusing on the, the lives of, of the people that were put there, also the lives of the people working there. And I think this balance between the two is extremely important. At the same time, it was important for us from a, sort of a perceptual kind of way that once you have this gravity towards the middle, we also wanted the actual cells to focus on them and give them some life quality inside, not just the way we designed them, but also the way that they could be used as a way of linking back to society. So what we did was, apart from everything in the center of the city, that's where we would put like the church and the cultural house and so the, the daily chores when you're working in workshops, we put them in the middle. But what we did then with the cells was we took them all and we let them point away from the prison. And that way we sort of balanced the fact of pulling gravity towards the center where life would unfold. And then on a psychological level, we were giving the prisoners this way of looking out and dreaming in a sense, perceiving themselves above or around or over the surrounding prison walls. And that way, I think we managed to, to work in a psychological way with the mind once you're you put into to the prison. I think that's another aspect that's important to, to underline. I think this is probably the difference between the, the British uh, sentence or jail system is that in Denmark, when you get a life sentence, for instance, this is probably going to be, be a shock to you, but life sentence, of course, is a life sentence. But percentage-wise, um, people... Uh, a life sentence is like 14, 15 years, and people can get on a parole after 10, 11 years. So there's also a strong focus, even a high security prison like this, that a lot of investment is put into making sure that you don't get more re-offenders. So therefore, the whole setup here is not just in terms of the daily chores and, and having a, a, a very uh, safe environment. It's also to make facilities where the staff is actually out and having a direct contact with the, the inmates. So the distribution of all the things supporting um, training and uh, having a meaningful everyday life with in terms of workshops and so forth is actually happening out in the units. Um, and here are some visualizations from the, from the project when we, we did the competition. And then to the realized project, which is pretty much very similar, of course. Um, but we did go through a very sort of scrutinizing process in terms of we did run into some financial problems. We, it got delayed a year, but overall, I think it looks very much what we set out to, to do. And here you see it in plan. So what's important to point out to understand the prison is that here we have the main building. We put outside here uh, a facility for the staff. Being in a sort of a rural area, there's a lot of staff that would be sort of commuting a long way. And since it's, a, of course, a 24-7 surveilled uh, uh, prison, there's 200, it's prepared for 250 inmates, and there's pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of staff, so there's like just as much staff working here. And so people that are commuting working here can actually stay outside the wall and live here and walk in every day and work in the environment in here. And in the center, we have a big sort of a, a big work unit in here, and then we have a cultural building here. And then these are all normal units put out here. And then we have, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, uh, the security part here for the negative strong prisoners. These are prisoners that you want to protect from others because they can either take over the prison. These are like heavy duty uh, gang related, uh, like the Hells Angels. We have a big problem with the sort of old motorcycle gangs in Denmark. But they sort of fractured out, and they're sort of running the whole narcotic uh, uh, 
um, um, environment in, in, in Denmark. So sometimes these guys go to jail. They are put over here, segregated away from the rest. And then, of course, you also have the kind of prisoners that uh, inmates that you have to isolate from the others because others want to harm them. And that could be anything from pedophile to other people that somehow are ranking lower in the prison. So there is sort of within this system, there's also a possibility of adjusting the prison to sort of accommodate these, not just heavy duty, dangerous prisoners, but also the shifting patterns. And I'll get back to the flexibility, which is very uh, is a key to, to, to the project. Here's a few pictures from the inside, the cultural building, and again, talking about vocabulary. It was very important for us to do architecture that didn't have this static uh, prison-like uh, pr presence. No bars in front of glass, we, we used glass. This whole building is actually wrapped in, uh, in, in glass, green glass. We used vocabulary like you see here with the roof scapes and so forth. So again, to kind of mirror where you come from, but how do you mirror where people come from when they come from all over the place? So we went in and used materials and really wanted to do high quality materials um, wrapped on the buildings. We used yellow brick, we used, as you can see here, we have metal cladding and then we have concrete, and we mixed it up and made traditional lampposts and so forth, so you would get this environment of being in a city, something where you came from. So normalcy was upkept in whatever you looked at. And in between buildings, we also put, Mariana will touch a little more on this, but we also used greenery a lot. Again, using healing tricks here in terms of stimulating the, the everyday um, sort of environment inside the, this prison. And here you see part of one of the normal units. I'll show you this in plan in a minute. And Mariana will talk a little more about how we not just worked with the buildings, but we really worked with the building and the surfaces of the buildings down on the landscape and vice versa. So there's a total integrated uh, way of working with the architect and landscape so they unite together. And with the, some of the specialists we had on board, the artist, we also had these two amazing women that worked with us doing color coordination and they also worked with intuitive wayfinding. Um, they work a lot within the, 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 the health industry, but they also work with, with other projects. But we used them here and they came up with an amazing concept for tattooing and working uh, on the pretty much dull surfaces like concrete here and kind of gave them a subtle character. Because that's another aspect, once you're in a prison where you obviously for will stay for many years in a high security like this one. It was very important for us to have also the small surprises that will grow on you over time where you would actually appreciate that everything is in the lining. So we worked very met meticulous going down into the details and try to set a scene and even such thing as, as the perimeter wall as this is was actually uh, um, handcrafted with these patterns that we used in the formwork of the concrete uh, elements. And color, by the way, is also something we work with. So I'll go through a few of the buildings inside so you can see how this particular project tries to accommodate the shifting patterns of people that go into prisons, how this can work in terms of as a tool for staff and people that support staff in terms of educating and giving people maybe a better uh, prospect of when they get out, they don't become reoffenders. So the normal units are actually very much about mingling staff together with the, the people that are put there, but also giving them an uh, uh, everyday uh, quality of life, um, but also giving them a quality of community, building community. So every unit is divided up in a two-floor uh, size building, and there's a long sort of corridor here which we treated with color, and every cell is down this corridor, and there's about seven units uh, down a corridor like this. Now, flexibility is really important in prisons today because the shifting patterns of, of what happens inside the prison, we have found that through dialogue again with the client that the, the biggest challenge is really some of the shifting patterns in terms of reorganization within, let's say, gangs and, 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 and so forth. So the whole syndicate syndrome of, of what will uh, arise in the prison that really also wanted a layout that was capable of sh sort of dividing the prison up into s smaller units so you can control but not just control also give the inmates uh, uh, um, uh, protecting them from each other so to speak so every unit here is uh, 
is basically built up around uh, sort of this long finger, as you see here, the seven cells. You have a common area here, a kitchen, and then staff is right here in the middle. And then everything that sort of sticks out here and here and down here are all sort of training facilities and uh, workshops down the back here in, in double height spaces and small courtyards in here. So on a daily basis, you could basically say that this prison could sort of coexist by itself within the prison. Um, so then for the bigger events in the prison on a daily uh, basis, if you have to go and see, let's say, a doctor, which is sort of looking out for all uh, everybody in the prison or going to play at a match at a basketball court or something, uh, we have those things you have to leave and you walk out here and you are sort of moving freely around the prison but you're monitored by, uh, by cameras and so forth. Um, and that's another aspect that I think has really changed uh, radically within the last five, ten years is the whole sophisticated way of monitoring. I know that here in London you're familiar with this. You walk around freely in your city and you don't consider this but here this was a big debate whether you could surveil that much but we implemented these uh, detectors all over the place. So this, of course, also gives a freedom. I think that's where technology really supports the way of doing um, a good job at, at taking care and, and re-socializing people within the prison system. And again, um, the whole thing with the color uh, part, we worked with these uh, color specialists and artists, and we really used this to sort of, again, take the static uh, notion away from the prison. But we didn't want to go and do it just like in a let's say a kindergarten or a school and just play with splash out uh, cool colors and so forth. We really also used it in a sort of a subdued way. So what you see down here in this corner here is that we sort of spattered it out and we worked with it in an artistic way. So we weren't looking down at the inmates. We were actually looking at them in eye height and doing, I would say, color coordination for the grown-ups. So this is at least <laughs> an attempt to do that together with our, our specialists. And um, the reference for, for doing this whole sort of um, doing a vocabulary that we could use for this and colors and so forth, um, we worked a lot with the sort of the, the tattooing of, of surfaces. So what you saw before was we did 3D printing in the concrete. We used color. So again, it's all in the lining and the perception of the prison. And this that was invested a lot in. And we sort of developed this sort of um, toolbox that we used on all the surfaces of the prison. And as you can see it here, this is the perimeter wall. There's a big concrete wall running around the entire prison. And that was uh, actually uh, one of the wake up uh, uh, discoveries for, for us as a team when we were doing the project together with the client. They said to us, we really don't need this wall because surveillance system today can actually make sure that you don't get out and you can just do it with wire and everything. So the wall here is basically more on a symbolic way and of course also symbolic to the area that we implemented the, the, the prison in because there was some sort of a resistance, not from the two farmers that sold the land to a pretty good price, but for the, for the area, <laughs> for the people in the area. So. I think then again, that's where I think we, you know, modern way of thinking or doing prisons is still sort of perceived as it needs this wall. And I think you, if you go back, let's say, a couple of thousand years and back to the Roman Empire, actual prisons weren't done outside. The, they were actually in the city, and you would actually have them, the, the prisoners, doing jobs for everybody in the city. And I think this is something we can talk about later on, but I think this was one of the, th the ideas here was we wanted to make a functioning city here, and in reality, we would have liked to have taken this wall away, but we couldn't. Anyhow. And another aspect here is, as I was speaking of, is one thing is the way of segregating and flexibility within the prison. Another uh, aspect we worked a lot on to, to do here is not just to work with the materiality, but also to work with the visual contact between staff and people in the prison. We'd, Going back to the panopticon idea, of course, there is a panopticon feeling here. You need one or two staff have to be able to run, let's say, a unit like the one, a normal unit here. So you need to be capable of looking down the different corridors. But you don't look into the cells. So that's the, your private uh, sphere. But what they do here is by putting glass in and uh, during the course of the day, these doors will be standing open. There's a very sort of direct contact between staff and, and the inmates. And again here, uh, the possibility, or not just the possibility, this is how they, they do the food. They make their own food, and they go and they buy groceries. So they go outside their unit, and they go and buy the stuff, and they prepare here in, in groups of, let's say, up to five or seven um, at a time. 
And again, different colors, yellow, blue, green, we work with. And these small courtyards in the back of the, uh, inside one of the units is, of course, your sort of everyday possibility of going out and being part, not just a landscape you look out at, but it's an active recreational landscape you can use. Now, this is probably where I think we were very surprised because we've done a lot of different projects, as I was explaining, but we hadn't done a prison before. Um, the cell, I assumed, and my group did, that there had been done a lot of research, and there were examples out there we could be inspired by, and I'm sure there are some. We didn't come across any. And um, I think this is probably where the biggest potential is to go in and do an improvement, we found out. And uh, what we discovered was nobody had really done anything with these 10, 15 square meters that an average cell is, is all about. So we saw a great potential here. So what we did was we wanted to create cells that could fulfill the flexibility and avoid the possibility of having direct look into other neighboring cells. We wanted privacy, but that's also from a security point of view. So we designed the cells as units that were pointing in their own sort of private uh, look away from the prison. And you can see that the, the cells are sort of lined up here. And if you look at this picture or photo here, you will see that these are all cells. So what we had is like we have a from floor to ceiling kind of a, a, a big window here that you can look out across the landscape and the sky. And the top ones can actually look over the perimeter wall. And then in the side walls, we put smaller sort of um, sandblasted glass so you can communicate to people from another section here because that's a big problem in prisons today is communication between the different prisoners. So you had to kind of sustain this possibility of segregation but still give the feel that you're part of something bigger. So we orchestrated the, the cells like this. And we also wanted the possibility to take fresh air into these cells. So apart from actually having uh, mechanical ventilation, there's also the possibility to overrule here. We have the possibility of opening louvers, so you can actually take fresh air in. And if you look at a plan, so instead of having your sort of typical square box here, we really felt that daylight was an important issue. So we pulled in light, as you can see on this uh, image here. And uh, we talking about the uh, participation of the users. Here we actually, together with the inmates from the prisons that are going to move here from Rieslus Lille, they built all the furniture in here, part of it, and got it installed. So there was also a user participation in, in, in this particular jail. And one thing we decided to do was, um, one thing is working with colors and art outside, but we really respected that the inmates, once they move into the cell, they kind of get to decorate themselves and have their own sort of impact. I think the only thing we decided was the color on the curtains, very institutionalized, the blue. <laughs> But uh, this is a picture of how the general room looks in the cell. And the small angle here is, does an amazing effect. Uh, you walk into the space, and it's the same size as an ordinary cell, around 14 square meters. This is the standard size in a, in a jail. Uh, but here, by angling it out and giving this side light coming in, it really sort of makes the space much larger. And um, for safety purposes, of course, the layout is not just done from aesthetic purposes. We put a, a sort of a round uh, shape to the bathroom in here. They have the private bathroom. It's only a one-person cell, by the way. It's not like what I have seen on, on from other jails in, uh, here in England where you're actually sharing a cell with several. So you have your own private uh, cell as this one here. And if you look inside here, we pre-made, um, manufactured these bathrooms, put them in. Everything here is, of course, also tested in terms of not just using pieces from here as weapons, but also another aspect you have to consider when doing, uh, I'm sure a lot of you here that work with, with uh, prison design, is the suicidal possibilities too. So everything here was tested in terms of being both breakable but not powerful enough to be used as a weapon. So we did a lot of research here in terms of doing just this right to get this. So it's a balance act, of course, trying to make it look like a normal bathroom, but still having to, uh, to take all these other aspects into consideration. So the cultural house, which is sort of the social place where everybody gather from the units in the center of the village, um, is a round building where we have a big um, common space in the middle, which is a big basketball court. And then it has a, a church, but it also has a praying room for, for people with different faiths. 
and it has a doctor practice library and so forth. So this is sort of one of the main buildings in the center of the village that everybody can use. And um, inside, we, we work not just as architects and got our way in terms of how we wanted to work with color and so forth. We also incorporate art into the project. And in Denmark, for every public building, you have to use around 1.5% of the total cost of the project. And this one was around 100 million, so that you do the math. But you can see that was quite a, a decent budget for doing art into the project. And instead of having a lot of artists, we took on board two artists. Uh, a guy called John Kerner. You think I might be tall? This guy is, <laughs> I think, the tallest artist. But he, as, and we didn't just pick him because he was tall, and he got to do the biggest, uh, got to do the biggest canvas probably done in Denmark. Um, here he's explaining about his uh, piece of work. Um, but what it really depicts here, and this also goes into the people that participated in the project. Everybody had to come in with their take of what prison was about, but also how could you use art and the architecture to re-socialize and also sort of perceive um, that people that come here probably come from somewhat of a broken upbringing, uh, what brought them on the criminal um, sort of track of, of, of life. So what he did was he did a piece here inspired by the area. Um, this is sort of a fjord landscape. And then he said, I took orange, uh, clockwork orange, and I took some of those elements in. So if you look carefully, you'll see boats that are sort of decaying and running ashore and so forth. So I think that was his sort of symbolic gesture back to, to, to the prison. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there was, uh, we put in a church and a, a praying room. And this is also to, to explain that prisons today, or at least in Denmark, has shifted. I'm sure in England it's been this for quite some time. But the sort of the, the, the way of people coming with different cultural backgrounds are actually a very much a part of the prison system today, too. Sadly enough, there, there's a, actually a percentage that is, I think, a little out of balance in terms of the population. And that, of course, also goes to, to, to say that we are also dealing with some of many of the same problems that you have in, in the larger cities as you have in England. So therefore, it was important for us not just to do a church room, but to do a, a room for people with different uh, belief uh, systems. Um, and here's a picture from that, and then the church we worked with. And again, working with daylight, bringing in not just sort of, um, we brought in like also wooden uh, material here. So we blended in a lot of materials here to give it this sort of, kind of give it a different feel, but also give it a different a touch of, of humanity inside. And another artist we worked with, Klaus Carstensen, a very interesting uh, artist. He got to do these five people standing out in one of the common courtyards where everybody moves as around and, and meet each other on a daily basis. And um, his idea behind this was to do, whenever you put five, seven people together, that was his sort of take on it, you have something that is resembling community. You probably have something resembling something that is just about to break up and do a rebellion, but it may also be people that are contemplating in terms of saying, we better do something good here. We, so it's like, a, it's again a balance act here. So that was his sort of symbolic gesture to, to, to the prison here to put this in. And these uh, figures are all sort of friends of his. Originally, we wanted to do casts, scan and 3D of some of the inmates that were to move into the prison here, but we got a no. <laughs> For the, uh, and for the obvious reason, of course, they would get heroic status or they would be uh, over tattooed or chopped down or whatever by, by fellow inmates. But that was, uh, that was his original uh, idea was to, 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 to do that. Um, but I think in many ways, if you take a close look, that's actually himself um, here. And you can see here, you see the 3D. It's actually a very interesting process he went through. He found the biggest 3D scanner in Europe, and he scanned. It's amazing what he could do there. So he scanned, you know, in, in 3D, but you can do the whole sort of thing with the coat and everything. And, 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 so, and then they were sort of done traditionally in copper, black copper, and they will be standing here. And those are all his friends standing around him, um, another artist. And they're all artist friends, so a famous artist standing in prison here in Denmark, <laughs> south of Copenhagen. And then at the end here, I'll just show you that that's the prison within the prison. This is for the very, uh, what is considered in uh, prison language, the negative strong prisoners. And this is, of course, a much more strict system within the, uh, the prison. So these 
small courtyards here is basically where they move around on a daily basis. And you could, of course, argue and say, is this a humane way to, 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 to treat somebody who's put into prison? Um, it has to be said that, of course, they also get to move around into the center of the city, but they are segregated. And it's, of course, for the good of the prison, but it's also in terms of sort of not contaminating the whole prison and, and bringing the level of, of tension up in the prison. So it is a controlled environment, very stiff controlled environment. And as you can see in this picture here, it's, it's a, it is still tough to, to be in this part of the prison. However, we did go in and we tried to give them, once they're out every day, to they have also some common space that are a little bit larger. And here we worked with this lining, colors and so forth, and looking out at the landscape at the end here. I think this will be my cue to you, Mariana, to talk a bit about outside in. This is a little bit about inside the prison, and you'll be taking the uh, okay. thing. Great. Thank you. Just take a, a quick moment to tee up your, your understanding of where you know, Marianne's background. Marianne Levinson, project landscape architect here and founder of, of her own uh, uh, landscape architecture company. She's previously worked at the studio of Professor Sven Ingvar Andersen. Uh, she taught at the School of Architecture at the Royal Danish Academy of Arts uh, and has realized projects ranging from private gardens, design of urban facilities, institutions, campuses, uh, renovations of large scale infrastructural installations, uh, master plans, landscape planning. So very broad landscape architecture experience and has won prizes including for the campus at Copenhagen Business School uh, and the landscape architectural part of the Tietgen Dormitory and she's won the Danish Art Foundation's first prize for environmental and public arts. So it's our great pleasure to uh, invite Marianne to tell us more. Thank you. I'm turned on. Yes. Okay. I will read for you. I don't have the the same uh, freely English speaking language, so I have I have made my text for a reading together with the pictures. Some of the pictures will be the same as mass shoot, but it's we have the same. We have one photographer, and he made these amazing pictures. And uh, the phot photographer, he went to the prison uh, immediately before it opened. So a lot of the green space is very new. I mean, trees are like this, and they will grow up to 25 meters high, but it takes some years. So it's, it's a little uh, bare in, in, in some of the growing landscape, but it is there. <laughs> it's, it's just not so visible right now. Oh, is the wrong? Okay. I will speak about a prison in the landscape and the landscape in a prison. From from the big landscape, and afterwards, inside the perimeter wall. The new Storstrom prison on Falster is located in an ancient agricultural landscape with traces of 5,000 years old habitation. This wide open terrain was sculpted by the last ice age in Scandinavia, creating a gently curving topography. The seven meter high and 1,300 meter long concrete perimeter wall um, is inscribed in this landscape, adding a new layer to the old geological history. One of the early inspirations for this larger bird eye view perspective is how to place the perimeter wall in this landscape. It was Christus running fence a geometrical line in dialogue with the organic landscape. The prison is located at a low point on the predominantly flat terrain on the island of Falster. 
The prison wall is carefully adapted to the variations of the terrain, and when the prominent new trees functioned as windbreaks around the large parking area are in place, they will incorporate the prison into the existing agricultural area where traces of earlier star pattern plots are still detectable. I must show you the, showed you this, um, uh, this uh, map from the agriculture system. But these pictures are how the, the seven meter high perimeter wall and the structure inside the wall is, is uh, placed in the landscape. We, we, even, though it's very, it's fl even though it's flat, it's very gently curved and we put it down and we made it running along the curves and across the curves so it has, in, in relation to the terrain, it has, um, it, it goes into it. I think the pictures show that. A landscape in the prison. Inside the prison wall, is it my, yeah. Um, inside the prison wall is 130,000 square meter new landscape with space, buildings and facilities for all the needs of 250 inmates and 250 staff, an entire enclosed village. And this one you already saw from, from our um, uh, competition uh, with this very green uh, areas around, it has been, uh, it, it's smaller now. At that time, we had the natural lakes inside the wall. The wall was going directly down to this. And we had uh, some, some, uh, um, some more agricultural elements, but it was, it was taken away. Um, not because of security, because of money. Um, <coughs> the entire landscape inside the prison's perimeter wall has been designed for the purpose of creating a visually varied and as aesthetically stimulating environment as possible. The aesthetic design of the environment inside Storstrand prison is important both for the inmates and for the staff who are in the prison on a daily basis. The fundamental aim of the design of the areas around the building is to add spatial and visual variation to the extremely static and closed environments. The very specific circumstances of the prison's environment with security considerations being crucial to every initiative determined the selection of materials, shapes and forms of expression in general. The building complex star-shaped structure centers around the inner road areas. The road surfaces are asphalt with stripes of red, black and white granite chippings. That's what you see in the plan here. Up against the building's facades, areas of grass create a buffer zone up to the windows and give the outdoor areas a green char character. The aspect of the aesthetic quality in the extremely controlled environment of a high security prison is of utmost importance for both inmates and staff to animate the horizontal outdoor areas and to emphasize the human scale in the space between the buildings, this bold graphic pattern in red, white and black asphalt covers the ground and intermingles soft with green areas. The stripe pattern strengthens the spatial perspectives and movements between the buildings. This creates a visual dynamic, compensating for the lack of natural horizon in the enclosed space. The outstanding feature of the graphically decorated street surface provides 
an aesthetic identity to the outdoor areas. The large expanse can be seen as a picture, almost a stage area, where three tones in the asphalt reinforce spatial patterns and depth perspectives. Adding to a more human environment, the space around the circular activities building has benches, beds of grass, and area lighting, creating an open and informal meeting place with size specific with the site specific sculptures by Klaus Carstensen as as the mass showed. Here you can see them in the corner. They are just shapes like like persons, and here they are closed. The possibility to spend time outdoors and have the opportunity to, for activities and movement in open air and to experience the shifting seasons and see the surroundings change is essential to a healthy perspective on life, especially for people who can't move around freely. The original landscape plan included an apple orchard of 600 trees, providing the possibility for the inmates to work with production of apples. It was not a romantic uh, idea, it was for production and for working with, this, with, with the apple production. The apple orchard was unfortunately taken out of the project in the later stage of planning due to the financial restrictions. But there's a, lo a large sports facilities with a full-scale outdoor football and track field. The sports area also include a running track and a basketball court. In the beginning, it was in international uh, sizes. So the, the thinking was that some of the inmates could be really good and participating in, uh, in uh, in sport uh, games out of the prison, but now it's it's not the exactly international size, but it's there. It's the running running track. The important idea of agricultural agricultural activity, however, has been achieved in the form of kitchen gardens where inmates can grow their own vegetables <coughs> for use in their own kitchens. All the sections have a number of courtyards and atria, all with fruit trees, furnishings, and equipment for recreation, games, and space for physical activity. The high security section is surrounded by this extra wall prison in the prison. Uh, and the only possibility for outdoor activity here is in this large cage with basketball court and um, this uh, enclosed steel cage. It's, uh, it's terrible to be there. It is, it's, really, uh, it's really terrible to, to stay in these uh, courtyards. It's, but it's, it's it's the most enclosed space in the, in the prison. And of course, they also have uh, visitor areas which are enclosed as well, like, like steel cages. In relation to the visitor's area in the normal section is, um, is a, a playground for children. And I think, Mass, you, you didn't show pictures from the visitor's uh, apartment. I could, just, uh, I could just support you by saying that there is in the yeah. prison there's maybe because it's away from the city, so people that have to go here have to commute far, and they get to stay there, let's say, for one or two days and visit somebody. You actually save up time to, to have your loved ones come there. So what we did was, in a sponsorship, by the way, uh, by not the state, but by a private foundation that helped us, and uh, we built this sort of visitor center. So you can actually get a small apartment where you... You spend time with your, your loved ones and children, of course, that can go out and play here while, yeah. Is that within the boundary of the prison or outside? 
this is within the boundary, but there's a segregated way to go there, and the yeah. also the, the, the terms of how do you visit the ones in uh, that are sort of allocated to the extra secure part. There's an underground, um, basically a long stretch of a hallway, because that's the whole thing. Is that I think today uh, with the ones that that know prisons quite well, that is uh, here in the audience, is that. The contact or knowing when somebody is visiting is just as important as segregating that as the prisoners seeing each other. So there's a, this was probably one of the hardest features to get in. How do you get soft, I would say, targets inside the uh, the prison to solve this? But mm -hmm. this is try again to to create something where you can spend, let's say, two or three days in somewhat of a normal framework. And it is it's it's also a, a very important part of the resocialization in Denmark to 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 work with the families and to try to yeah. keep the families together in, in, and to keep the relation between the mostly fathers and the children. It's how it is. And these uh, apartments, they are really like um, normal apartments with IKEA meubles and uh, a lot of um, play things for the children and they can have a weekend or some days where they are in in a home, and it's it's, I think it's really amazing uh, uh, rooms in this prison. It's working good, but it has also been a, a provocating thing, political, because it's it's this apartment. Ah, it would cost maybe ten millions in the center of Copenhagen, but the the standard is is very nice. Mm -hmm. So that's always a discussion. Is it too nice? And this is this is the as in the traditional Danish village, there's the church inside the prison. And in conjunction with the church there's a small sheltered garden. It's behind, but we didn't have any close up pictures because it was not finished at the time when the photo photographer was there and then after the prison was closed. So um, but this is uh, providing an invi inviting space for contemplation and reflection. Lavender and crab apples give the garden an intimate and relaxed atmosphere. And there's room for space to gather after church events. From the cells in the normal sections and from the street areas, there's a visual connection to the marshes and the grassland with trees which are surrounded by the inner security fence and the high perimeter wall. Alders, silver willows, oaks, ash trees and mirabelle are carefully positioned, taking into con consideration the civilian system. The tr there's a lot of trees, but it's not so visible now. But the trees will grow up and they will grow big over time and they will create an area of nature in interplay with the broad curved rain beds that ensure natural rain water drainage and create fertile ground for the marshes natural vegetation. And here you see it function with water. There is, it's really a wetland. We had so many problems with the water in this ground. Yeah. And it, it collects a lot of water. There's also an entrance that wall there. And Somebody might yeah. wonder why did we put this? Is this art? It's actually a perimeter wall again, segregating if people are sort of moving out here that you cannot again visually look to the people in the cells. So there's been a lot of study of sidelines in the prison in terms of again signaling to people yeah. that you're supposed to be segregated away from. Yeah. Of course in, in some years time the the these willow trees, they will be really big and really fat. So after some years, it, it will help with the sidelines. But in the beginning, this, it, this was a, a new element that, that the best made. The large sky and its shifting character throughout the days and nights give the enclosed environment a welcome variation. The biggest challenge and our main focus 
for the prison in the landscape and the landscape in the prison has been to integrate the human scale and the human dimension to create a varied green environment with gardens and large trees without compromising the rigorous security demands. On the pictures we have shown, the trees are small, but after five years time, the landscape in the prison will have changed to a greener environment with blooming fruit trees and larger trees that change character along with the changing seasons. And this, this aspect is for all of us very normal, but if you sit seven years, 10 years, it's really a, a, a human need to follow the seasons. It's, it's, it's so simple, but it, we think it's so important to, to have some, some uh, ongoing time in this very static situation. Mm -hmm. That was the last picture for me. Thank you very much, Marianne. It's, it's, it's a remarkable, uh, a very, very different approach to, uh, to, to prisons. And um, uh, you know, the detail, the idea of having wetlands and things, are fantastic. But uh, really, we need to maybe try and uh, now bring a bit of uh, perspective. And, and for that, um, Peter Dawson, we are very privileged to have here tonight. And Peter um, will contextualize somewhat in the UK sense, and then, then we'll move to a discussion uh, reflecting on the design, inviting your questions, uh, and, and, and trying to bring this more rounded um, placing of this prison in the, in the wider context. But just a bit of background on Peter, first of all. So Peter Dawson took up his role as director of the Prison Reform Trust uh, in August 2016. And before that, his career included uh, being working on prisons policy in the Home Office in the 1990s and governing two prisons uh, between 2004 and 2012. Some, some really hard-edged experience he's got here. Um, and at, while at High Down Prison, he oversaw the opening of the first Clink restaurant, which some of you may have, may have heard of. Uh, the prison became a center for innovation, hosting new, new projects such as the Restore Program run by the Forgiveness Trust, uh, Forgiveness Project. Um, a subsequent spell was in the, uh, the private sector with Sodexo, uh, leading operational design and the mobilization of the company's successful bids to run new community rehabilitation companies in six different regions. Uh, he's also spent seven years as a trustee for the Kenwood Trust, which is a charity dedicated to the care of people with substance misuse uh, problems. And he's acted as an advisor to the Correctional Services of South Africa for a short period in 2003. So a very deep and broad experience around prisons, and I, I invite Peter to come and comment. I, I need to change that biography because I always feel like I'm going to be a disappointment after someone's read it out. Um, I've, had a, I've had a very lucky time. I've been to um, uh, lots of different prisons. And it sounds odd, doesn't it, to say you're lucky to have been in lots of prisons. But I genuinely do feel I, I have been. Um, but can I start by seeing how unusual I am in this room in having been in a prison? It's an odd question to ask. I, I do this quite often, say, have you been in a prison? That doesn't mean that you have to have been a prisoner, though maybe some people have, and that doesn't matter. But how, how many people have actually spent any time at all inside a prison? Right, that's, that's really helpful. Um, for, for those of you who haven't, and in case you get bored over the next sort of five or ten minutes, um, I want you to imagine that on your way in, um, those nice people saying hello took your mobile phone off you. Um, and I also want you to imagine that the doors at the back are locked, uh, and I'm going to decide when they're unlocked. So if you get bored, just think about what, what's going through your mind over the next, might be 10 minutes, I might decide it's an hour, I might decide it's three hours, I might decide I'm not unlocking the doors until tomorrow morning. Just think about what is going through your mind because of that. Um, and I suspect it's not going to be a very happy experience as you think that. And, and all of this, this is, this is not what prison is. Um, prison is that experience of having your freedom taken away. And it's not about the walls. Um, it's about me. It's about the person who suddenly has authority over you 
and it's about the people that you've left behind. Now, the Prison Reform Trust, who are we? Um, we're a pressure group. Uh, we've been around for about 36 years. We have two very simple objectives and they're linked. The first is that we think in this country we use prison far too much, that there are too many people in prison and we should reduce that. And the second is that we want to improve conditions in prison and they're linked because in this country our overuse of prison is what's made it so difficult to improve prison conditions. And as it happens, uh, just at the moment, we are in a period where prison conditions have got much worse. Um, and that's a shocking thing to be saying about any public service, but certainly a public service where you have the care of other people's lives completely. Um, the, the, the way we go about it is we try and influence the people who take decisions about prisons, and that's all the usual activities for pressure groups. Um, but something that we're trying to do a lot more is to involve prisoners themselves in influencing that debate and coming up with solutions. Um, and I do think that if anywhere is going to have the title of the most humane prison uh, in the world, uh, its design is going to have been led by the people who have to live in it. Um, and it's really interesting looking at what you've put up, the things that I suspect matter most to the people who live there and some of the things that you haven't mentioned. Um, which, if there's time, I'd be really interested to find out whether they exist or not. Um, last bit about PRT, Prison Reform Trust. This is our signature publication. It's called The Prison Fact File. It has the slightly odd title of the Bromley Briefings. Um, I come from Bromley, uh, but that's not the reason for that. Uh, there used to be a company that sold shoes called Russell and Bromley, and they now have a charitable trust, and they pay for this, uh, this publication every year. It has saved the life of many a criminology student um, wanting to write an essay late at night. It has everything you could want to know about prisons in this country and the people in them. Uh, and most of it comes from published statistics. Um, and there are some very extraordinary things in there which will take you by surprise. Um, look it up on our website. Right. Um, prisons in the UK, a bit of context um, and thinking particularly about what they're like physically. There is an absolutely extraordinary variety. So we have about 120 prisons. Um, I spent some of my sort of training as deputy governor in Brixton Prison, which was built in about 1820. Last year I visited Stafford Prison, which unbelievably has an 18th century uh, wing, and it's rather beautiful. It's on a very slight sort of crescent. Um, and there's no reason for that, except that it's beautiful. Um, and when you're inside, it really changes the feel. And what you said about the angle in the corner of the cell, I can really sympathize with. Um, but we also, we have a fetish for building prisons in this country. We've built a lot of them, um, and we have built a lot over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, one of the prisons I ran was built um, in the late 1980s. Um, you would think that we would have got quite good at it, and in some respects we have, uh, but in some respects we really haven't. Um, the, the other thing which really characterizes our prison system is that Whilst the number of people in prison has nearly doubled over the last 25 years, the rate at which we overcrowd prisons has not changed at all. So about 25% of the people in prison tonight are going to be sleeping in a room which was designed for fewer people than are in it. Uh, most of those people will be sharing a cell designed for one. Uh, some will be three people in a cell for two. Um, another slightly curious thing about crowding uh, and that word is that the size of cell that we now build for one person is smaller than the Victorians built for one person. So we don't mind, it seems, cramming people in together. Another thing about overcrowding is not just the physical experience of that, but because prisons are so full, we move people around the country. As we speak, there are vans all over the country ferrying people between prisons because that's necessary to keep virtually every bed slept in every night. And we have to clear out local prisons for people who are arriving from court. And that means if you're a prisoner, where you are held is really down to the convenience of the system, not down to your personal requirements or what is best for you. We have a massive variety. So there are prisons in stately homes. Um, I thought the prison that you were replacing looked rather beautiful, actually. Um, <laughs> but we have, uh, we, we have prisons in, you know, there's one in an Elizabethan manor house. Um, alongside the newest and most high-tech. We have tiny prisons, 
and we have fairly enormous prisons, so the biggest prison in the country is designed to hold 2,000 people. Um, and their function is completely different. Uh, you're right, we have very long sentences. We have appallingly long sentences, even compared to what they used to be 15 years ago. So I'm regularly talking to people who are looking at spending the next two or three decades of their life in prison. And we have 60 people in the country who will die in prison no matter what happens. Every year, around 300 people are now dying in our prisons. About a quarter of them take their own lives and the rest die of natural causes, um, though that will sometimes have been hastened by poor health care. So although we don't have the death penalty, we have a large number of people who are expecting to finish their life in prison. Um, now that prison estate, that massively varied, sometimes very old prison estate, um, obviously has certain characteristics which don't help. Um, the physical dilapidation is very noticeable, um, and people who've been to prisons in this country will often go to prisons which are just falling apart, which are crumbling. Um, uh, there's also a, a disadvantage in terms of the philosophy of those very old prisons, because they are built around the idea of separation and of people contemplating their sins as though that will somehow uh, cause a change in behaviour. But there are also opportunities of such an incredibly diverse estate. Um, a lot of our prisons have been converted from another use. And sometimes if you think back to what that use was, there is a clue as to how you could make the prison more humane and more effective. Um, one of the prisons I ran was a prison for women, a place called Downview, and it was essentially, it was the nurse's home for a mental hospital that had used to exist on the site. And when I arrived, the, um, the, the, the main accommodation, the nurse's home, when it was converted, uh, they had put huge bars. Um, I mean, I'm not quite sure what they thought they were going to contain. I mean, the bars that would have kept a rhinoceros in the cell um, over all the windows. And it was being refurbished. Um, and I said, well, I'm not quite sure why we have those bars. Do you think we could take them out? And of course, I was told no. Um, so, but but what, what, what is the purpose of the bar? And it's to stop someone physically getting out of the, the window. But lots of the windows are sort of 40, 50 feet above the ground. So you're not going to try and get out of the window to escape. You might try and get out because you want to kill yourself. Um, a very wise man said to me, those, those windows that are behind the bars are domestic double glazing. And there will be many people in the room who know much better than me that with domestic double glazing, one pane is very tough to stop the burglar getting in, and one is pretty fragile. So we turned them round. So the pain on the inside was very tough, and the pain on the outside was very fragile. Because on the whole, we didn't have to worry about burglars coming in. <laughs> um, and it meant that we could take the bars out. So all of a sudden, this prison started to look like a nurse's home again. And we did all the things that you've talked about. So for some reason, the prison service believes in painting all its skirting boards black. So we didn't. We painted them in pastel colours. Um, I was told that the showers, which are communal showers, you couldn't have coat hooks because women might hang themselves from the coat hook, which meant that women didn't shower because they couldn't take a dressing gown with them because there was nowhere to hang it up. I was told that you had to have half-height doors on the toilets and the showers so that you could see whether someone was going to kill themselves in a the shower. And it's just a nonsense. Um, so we did away with lots of that, and actually its former use was useful in designing its current use. Uh, I'll move on, on quickly. There is an unhappy history in this country of new prison designs um, at which people probably appeared at events like this and said, we have designed something that will rehabilitate, that will transform the prison experience in this country. And perhaps the most famous example is Holloway Prison, which in the 1960s was built to a radical new design. Very happily, Holloway was closed a few years ago because it had become one of the most dangerous, unhappy prisons in the country. So we should approach prison design with a great deal of humility because what we think may transform doesn't, doesn't always. Um, I don't think that about this, by the way. I think it's fabulous. Right, let, let me just finish with a few thoughts about sort of prison design. I think prison design is about your philosophy of imprisonment. It's where you must start. Um, and we say a lot of things about imprisonment which are right, which we don't follow through. But the things which we say that are right as, are that we send people to prison as punishment, not for punishment. 
that when people are in prison, they retain their citizenship. Now, in many ways, we abuse that. Um, we don't let prisoners vote, for example, which is a highly symbolic way of saying that someone doesn't matter anymore. But they are citizens, and all the authorities that care for us also have a responsibility towards prisons. And the other thing that I think we don't say enough, but we should say about our philosophy of imprisonment, is that when you have the care of a whole person and the total care of a whole person, you have a responsibility to allow them to develop as a whole person. So rehabilitation, whatever that means, matters, and people should have the chance to build a new life. But if one of my children was sent to prison and was going to be there for even for six months, at the end of six months, I would want them to be a different person to when they went in. And that's not just about the reason they went there in the first place. It's everything else about them. So if they're a musician, I want them to be a better musician. Um, if they're good at relating to other people, I want them to have the opportunity to use those skills. If they've gone into prison for 10 years, I want them to be really different. And the only way you, to ach you achieve that is to provide freedom within the prison and the opportunity for, for development. Now, if those are your guiding principles, it feeds into what a prison is like physically. Um, and I, I'm not competent to talk about new prisons, but there, I know that there are architects in the room. I think I've been told that architecture is just as much about the tiny detail as it is about the big picture, and the tiny detail matters in prisons. So a few things that that philosophy should feed through into prison design, whether it's new or existing. A prisoner should always have a lock on their door. That space should be a private space, because if you're a citizen, you're entitled to private space. It should have a handle on the inside of the door so that you know you can open it and you don't rely on somebody to open it for you. There shouldn't be bars on the window in this day and age because they're not necessary and all they are doing is symbolising imprisonment. There should be freedom of movement within the prison because if you are going to be responsible for your own health, for example, you need to be able to get to a doctor's appointment. You can't be relying on somebody else to get you there uh, whether you are able to or not. I think there should be permeable boundaries because if you are a citizen... And if you are going out into society again, and society wants you to play a full part as a citizen, there's no point locking you away and then suddenly saying, out you go. And there's no point saying to the society outside, you belong outside because prison is different and separate from you. So again, an example, when the big prison I ran, there was a big building project and we built a second gate to get equipment and material into a sterile area where the prison was being expanded. When that was finished, I wanted to keep the second gate because I thought there should be more movement in and out of the prison rather than less. I think that facilities and assets within the prison should be shared. So if there's a gym in the prison, um, I guarantee at the moment every prison gym in the country is empty. Um, but if you're in a school now, you expect the gym to be used in the evening by the community. Well, there's no reason at all why that shouldn't be true in prisons. Prisons should have theatres. Uh, medical facilities in prisons should be available for use by other people. And that all comes from your philosophy. The, the very last thing that I would say about prison design, which I think is a big challenge to the next generation of prison designers, is that we have been obsessed for a very long time with escape and that the purpose of the prison is to prevent escape. Um, I don't think prisons need walls around them. Um, but when you talk about surveillance, actually, we are so overlooked here now and in society. It's very difficult to imagine what a prisoner who escapes then does. Because you can't, you can't use a bank card. Um, you can't walk down the street because facial recognition technology will spot you. So actually, prisoners who escape by and large now in this country, and it's rare, escape for a few days because their grandmother is dying or their child is unwell or they've been bullied in the prison and they don't know how to cope. So perhaps we stop thinking about escape as the most important thing in the design of a prison. Um, final thought, we would love to see fewer prisoners, which would mean that we should be closing lots of prisons. So perhaps we should design prisons that can be used for other things. <laughs>
get some discussion going and some questions. Um, I might ask one or two to, to just get things stirred up a little bit. Uh, so Peter, just to sort of link it back to the, to the particular prison that we've, 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 we've seen in some detail here. What are the particular aspects of Storstrom prison that you could say, well, you either like that and you'd like to see that kind of applying more broadly, or clearly the one not having bars um, in Windows, yeah. but, but maybe some other details you could pull out. Uh, or is, well, did you see something there? You said, well, actually, no, that's, that's, I don't get that. I really don't, from my experience, I would oppose that. Um, I, I, I saw lots that I liked. Interest saw lots and lots of things that you see in some prisons some of the time uh -huh. in this country. Um, so things like the areas where people can cook their own meals. You will see in some prisons and in some of our highest security prisons, perhaps not the places that you would expect. Um, I really like the cell design. I think that's absolutely crucial. It's where people spend so much of their time. What was that cell size, the 14 square meters? Yeah. Was, that, was that a standard in the UK too? Or, or it's, yeah, it's, it's not far off. Um, you pr probably a bit bigger, um, but, but it's, the, it's the little crooked bit that makes a difference. Um, and floor to ceiling window, I think, is mm. fabulous. Um, I thought the cage in the high security bit of the prison was disgusting. Mm. Yeah. It's horrible. Mm. Um, but I guess the, the, the biggest thing I feel about it and the biggest challenge to its humanity is not what it is or what it looks like, but where it is. Yeah. Because I look at those pictures and I see this thing dumped in a remote place. And going back to what it feels like to be a prisoner, and if I were a prisoner, the thing I would miss most is my family. And the idea that my contact with my family requires them to find a couple of days when they can come and stay in a remote place. I just, just imagine what that feels like at the end of that two days. Um, in my ideal prison, I would be seeing my family um, all through the week. And my question about the cell design is, is there a telephone in it? And can they get on the internet? Because that's what would matter to me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, there's not. Um, mm. in <laughs> but I mean, I, you, you're touching on, I think, um, things that are extremely important, of course. We, we had that discussion, of course, we had no sort of uh, say in where they were going to place this uh, jail. I think the debate in Denmark, at least, um, just like probably in the UK, is how much it costs to build a prison. So if you were to buy the same land in the city, it would have been doubled up. And I think it's also sense a signal. It's been used as a token politically. Uh, now I'm moving away from, from answering in terms of the cell, but there's been a big debate about a high security prison. Should there also be an extra punishment in terms of pushing it away? And I think I, I totally agree with you. This forcing families often, of course, from poor conditions, that, that obviously where a lot of crime uh, starts is because of people are in despair. So therefore, you come from, let's say, a background where it's also expensive to, to mm -hmm. travel to these places. Um, so I think that, in a sense, is an, an added punishment to, to, to be there. And that's also where we, as architects, and together with the landscape, we try to at least use this gravity towards the center and create this kind of normalcy around a city center. At least we would take the cells and the perception of pointing away. So you had a little bit of both worlds. And I don't know if that will, of course, uh, push the longing to go back to where you are. You're pointing in that direction. But at least for us, it was a way of giving at least the gesture of, of being uh, linked to the outside world. But again, it is uh, something that's moved far away. And then on top of that, of course, there is also the, the uh, it's in a part of the country where there's a lot of unemployment. So the political dimension was, of course, also to give, provide jobs. So it was kind of uh, one of those things that, that went down. Yeah. But that's where we are against politics, mm -hmm. you know, and the public opinion on what is punishment sort of a thing, because there has been debate. This project here, I think I mentioned it to you all, that it was about 100 million uh, pounds, which is, I mean, you look at a, let's say, a high-end uh, hospital, it's about the same square meter price. And, uh, but I think the politicians were quite clever going out explaining this. They said, yeah, but if this tool, in terms of providing good rehabilitation, and you really believe in a penal system where you sort of funnel people out after a period of years, and they serve the sentence, and they should be, come back as well-functioning citizens, by investing this much into it, and we can prove that, and I hope, uh, I know for a fact that, of course, we won't do it all, but it will be a contribution that the surroundings and the amount of money spent on staff 
uh, one to one. I think the numbers will start to show that reoffenders, which are costing much more than the cost of building and running a prison, yeah. and I think this is really where politicians lose sometimes the arguments. You could say the same about hospitals. To do a ten five percent more efficient hospital, you don't have to do the math very quickly. Within five ten years, it's paid itself back. And this has really been the debate that's gone on uh, between should you invest this much in the prisons? And that's where it, 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 it sort of came into to, to realization mm -hmm. because it made sense. Uh, it kind of, I mean, I'm sure you can. I, 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 <laughs> how wonderful Sorry. to have politicians who think it's important that it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Marianne, do you want to, to comment on this point? Or? Um, uh, yeah, comment here on, on, on this here with. with, with at det kan gøre en forskel og, og, og investere de, de penge, men at, at også det her med at lægge det udenfor i et landskab, det er det, du har arbejdet med. Ja, yeah, but I, I, the, the main point was the land, uh, the land was cheap. Mm. And the land was, uh, uh, and the farmers got a good price, because when we start to, to, to dig in the earth, it was a kind of mud that is very, very uh, problematic. Uh, um, I don't know what it's called in English, this kind of uh, uh, earth. It, it, was it, was, it wasn't great farmland, it wasn't good land. It was no. not a good farmer <laughs> land, no, but it was happy farmers. It, it was a cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but Mariana, I think we have to, to say so that they had water already there, right? That's they, part of it. They yeah. had some yeah. small waters, and we have this, uh, <laughs> uh, you have it in here also, we have this uh, protected water holes. So the animals can can jump yes. through the landscape and get the feeding and uh, protected wetland. So yeah, and these exactly. so yeah. these um, water holes were in the landscape, uh -huh. and we tried to get these natural elements inside uh -huh. the perimeter wall, and we succeeded with that mm -hmm. until they have to save a lot of money for some other reasons. Also, uh, reasons. Uh, because of a political pressure to um, a, a pressure about things inside about the 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 character of of uh, materials could we have wooden floors mm. you had this or should it be like institutional with this uh, yeah. linoleum it has maybe it was not always a question about money, but it, it was somehow a question about what what signal do we show the world? Are we coming into a a, 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 a room like a, in a hotel or in a, a drop-in cabin, or are we coming to a prison in this in the, in the it's aesthetic view? a bit view. harder with the linoleum instead of the timber. Yes, <laughs> yes because there's so much discussions also because there are a lot of yeah. foreigners yeah. L going to the prisons, mm -hmm. and for them it's maybe like a luxury hotel. Mm -hmm. It was the the bad political mm -hmm. discussion, yeah. and it was also outside about uh, this landscaping, in how many trees, how nice. Uh, uh, we cannot speak romantic landscape here, but we could speak activities, and we could speak. Uh, production and we could speak sport areas as to mm. activate mm. and do some uh, regular uh, things. It's not about aesthetic only, but the aesthetic is in our mind very important because the aesthetic also meets you as person, as body in a space. It it uh, it um, mm. It makes you f f yeah. feel that you are you you can stay in a space. So, so it's this a very important element. Was this aesthetic, uh, the, the kind of design detail? Yeah. Was that driven in part by any, um, I don't know, any particular sort of scientific theory or or, 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 or research or, or by prisoner input or anything? Yeah. Well, the, we we set up like I was explaining in the beginning. We took a lot of ideas from healing architecture, of course, in terms of as a toolbox. So the sensoric aspects of Let's say something, I mean, one thing is what you see, but how do you, everybody here, you raised your hands before who had visited a, a prison, uh, but 
a lot of people's perception of a prison is also the sound that it makes, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. stress infecting uh, noise that it creates. So a lot of focus here was also for us to kind of create a different acoustic inside. So the, the sound and the feel and the smell of the prison would be more like a normal home. And this sounds like something that's very easy to do, but when you have a high demand in terms of locks and everything in the mm -hmm. prison, this was something where we sat down with uh, our team of architects and we basically had to invent the wheel because, uh, well, for the natural fact that there hadn't been built that many prisons, there weren't any, that many components that could meet this kind of uh, demand. So we also developed a lot of components that you take for granted, but let's say, for instance, like the ceiling com com components, specialized, aesthetically looking nice ceilings weren't existing, so we had to develop them. So we did a lot of customized design inside in the lining of the, uh, the prison to go back and give this sort of natural environment. I think this affects on a daily basis when you're sitting in some place where you can basically just move, let's say, a few meters every day or a couple of hundred meters within the confinement of the prison. So we wanted it to be possible to create safety, but also this normalcy. So to answer it very shortly, is that those were the tools we took in. We set up sort of certain targets we wanted to, to achieve. So there's a lot more time spent to what meets the eye here because unfortunately pictures only show what you see. But the feel of the place is quite remarkably different than some of the prisons. When we did the research together with the client once we won the competition, we went around and, and, and saw a couple of uh, neighboring uh, prisons in Sweden and Norway and so forth. Um, so it's quite a, this I think is a game changer to this uh, prison as well, is, is in the detailing um, and the landscaping, of course, as well. Can, can, I, yeah, can, can I just ask that you uh, speak to the microphone and then uh, yeah, we'll, we'll switch to questions now. So, uh, It's working. It is working. Um, it's just about that, that idea of consultation. Did you get a chance to talk to prisoners you know, and, to, and to work with them on developing a design? Well, we, not directly, no. But I, I, that's an <laughs> you, you have to tell the story in Hamdina for Kua. Oh, yeah, the, the guy from the choir when we won the competition. That's true. Um, yeah, I'll tell that story. Just, yeah. But the... the um, the way we, we met the prisons, I would say, was through a very, very well-documented uh, brief when we did the competition. It wasn't just like your ordinary little brief. It was like a several binder with a lot of interviews. So it was second sort of, it wasn't direct dialogue. But once we won the competition, we got into to be in dialogue with a lot of the staff that have worked the prisons, also people, psychologists and psychiatrists and so forth. So we had the whole spectrum. Um, but we were kept away, and that was for security reasons, simply. I mean, uh, we, we were not allowed to get in, in direct contact. I think the only time we got a direct contact was when we won. We were invited to an uh, art museum, which is situated not too far from the site, and the top of the Danish uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, system were there from the criminal, uh, uh, from the police, and, and from, from the provision uh, uh, um, staff were there. And they were all standing there with the, the gear and everything. And then there was a choir of inmates standing there singing. And one of them had the microphone. So that's where we were We were confronted, just like you're sitting there. He took the microphone, and then he said <laughs> out to the entire uh, people that were in the space, oh, I have an additional list of what I want in the prison. <laughs> so I think that was the first use of uh, <laughs> dialogue we had. But I have to say that, that after we did it, and the first uh, p uh, inmates have moved in, um, there are, of course, things that still need to be adjusted inside uh, the prison in terms of things that, that still have to be altered. But the overall reception, uh, and this is not just by staff but by the inmates, has been quite well received. And um, the latest reports we got is that they like their home <laughs> and think it's a big improvement. Of, but of course, going back to the whole aspect of being that far away from, let's say, where most of them are coming from, of course, people have all kinds of geographical backgrounds. Some will be close, but most of them, of course, come from the bigger cities. However, it's still only about an hour. I don't know how much the commute time. I came here from Gatwick. It's still pretty much close to the same. So, I mean, we are talking something that's within reach uh, in, in, in a short amount of, of, of time. That has to be said as well. Uh, Denmark okay. being a small country. <laughs> Another question? Can I just... Um, touch on, I think, a crucial aspect. 
which I was wondering about all the way through. You actually answered the question for me because you said that's a prison with a capacity of 250 prisoners with 250 staff. Yeah. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. So obviously, I presume you must have known that from the beginning in the brief and been able to, to design a prison with such freedom and open spaces. We've also invested hundreds of millions of pounds um, building prisons in the UK, particularly in Scotland recently, um, of a comparable standard. I mean, the architecture is fabulous, but we do not have a one-to-one -one ratio. I'm sure that Peter has the statistics, particularly after the recent cuts. So I'm afraid that um, we've had riots in places like HMP Grampian simply because there aren't enough staff in there. There isn't this one-to-one -one ratio. So I think that's one of the, the crucial aspects which enables any humane architecture to be created. Without that, it's just not possible. Peter, do you want to add I mean, a comment to that? I, I sort of agree. I mean, I always think that, that the comparison I draw is in, in the real world, outside prisons, if you live in a place with lots of police, you feel unsafe. Um, if you live in a place with no police, you probably feel safe. Um, and prison should be aiming for the same thing. So actually, I think safety in prison and the absence of riots comes from the way the whole community operates. Um, and that isn't necessarily about the number of staff. Your objective should be getting to the point where staff are not necessary because people consent to the community that they're living in. Um, Having said that, where we are at the moment, um, that confidence needs to be built up and people need to know that there is a, a proportionate use of authority and that um, they would rather that authority was vested in the people who are paid to exercise it than in other prisoners. Um, but, I, but I do think that we, 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 we run good prisons when we really involve the people who live there in deciding how the community functions. So the famous example in this country, of course, is Grindon, which is not a well-designed prison by anybody's um, uh, book, uh, and has some of the most dangerous people in the country living in it. Um, it doesn't have a huge number of prison officers. It has an awful lot of people making the community work. But fundamentally, the decisions in Grindon are taken as a community. I remember speaking to a guy who governed it, and he said, you can't decide anything in Grindon in anything less than about three months because it all has to be consulted on endlessly. Um, but it's a, it's a safe place because of, the, because of that, I think. Um, next, my, my friend. Yeah. Oh, well, go there, excuse me there. And then we come to front. Yeah. I was just curious about um, the fact that the secure prisoners didn't seem to have either access to the cultural or to the church? Do they all go together or, you know, what's the well, regime there? The, uh, no, they don't. Uh, of course, th when they go out, other parts of the prison is closed off, so it's all a coordinated kind of a, a daily uh, rhythm, if you will. Um, but that's for the obvious reason. But that also happens within what I would call the normal units. So there's this constant kind of orchestrating mm -hmm. of the so sort of the way people move around. But the sensation once you're outside should be the same, whether you're in the sort of more secure part of the prison or not once you're in the village. Um, but this, is, this also goes to show that, that there is these sort of different um, sort of levels of, of, of tension in the prison. However, I'd have to say that, that what, through the discussions we had, and this was, uh, and of course, new to me, having done a prison before, was that the, the dangers or the possibility of a rebellion or, or somebody harming somebody or, or so forth is much more dangerous with the, the normal units sometimes because that's where you have things that are sort of in, in motion, whereas people with high sentences that are sort of considered to be the most dangerous, they're simply just confined where they are because they would, it's more to do with the hierarchy and dominance than necessarily doing something. So. I think the, the, the real sort of um, concern in prisons today is this sort of constant shifting pattern. And also the fact that, uh, going back to both the landscape and how an everyday uh, situation is in the prison, that it's a lot of young people that's really sort of the challenge. A lot of young people come from homes where they haven't learned sort of the natural things that we would consider with, uh, you know, to, to teach our kids and so forth. So they come from broken backgrounds. They don't know the simplest things like cooking a meal and so forth. So this whole 
um, way of, of having this close link with staff every day, helping them to, to sort of have a, not just a normal surrounding, but have a normal purposeful every day. And, but to, you have to be capable of having eyes on it, of course, all the time, because there is always this aspect of something can, can blow up. And, and one surprise to me, I don't know if it's the same in England, uh, is that if there's a rebellion in a prison in Denmark, for instance, they don't have weapons in there, the staff. They call upon the rest of the staff and they close down the rest of the prison and they call the police. So you have to sort of su sustain uh, uh, you know, a rebellion for quite some time. And that, of course, being in a remote area there, that has been, of course, also a concern. But it gives you an idea of that prisons today are not what we, I suppose, we, we, we sort of think of when we see, let's say, American movies. I don't know what it is in England, but we, in, in, in Scandinavia, it's totally different. It is really like being on the outside, just with people with uniforms and, and looking after you. Um, yeah. Hi there. Um, I, I'm just interested to know about design standards. Did the client have a set of design standards that required this, you know, a wing to be this size, a cell to be that size? Yeah. And if there were, um, how much you could test it and how receptive they were to doing something slightly different or new ideas or something? They were very, um, they were very on. I would say there was a very good dialogue with the client. You have to look at it. Maybe the buildings look old, but the thinking behind and the investment in in, in terms of of catering for for the inmates. They've been sitting there for so many years wanting this tool, so they were well prepared. So when we got the job, uh, we did it together with them in terms of testing a lot of things. And we that's probably where you spend the most time when you do a prison design. Is of course making sure that it will be a safe environment that it will last. And there was also a very strong uh, focus, not just from running costs, but from political side, that the investment here should last as long as some of the old prisons. And obviously pointing out across the landscape, many of these buildings are, are from the last century. So there was also a high focus on not just quality in terms of the sensory qualities, but from the lifespan of things. So for instance, doing things with natural brick, quality brick, can't say quality concrete, but to sort of do something with the concrete. So it had an ornamental um, uh, purpose, but also, again, from this stimulating the environment so it didn't become too static. All these aspects were very, um, they were very welcome towards it. But it's true what my, my Yana was saying. There was a balance act. You didn't want to sit on that this was sort of a, a holiday home or, or a school to do for well-to-do kids. <laughs> So it had to be sort of balanced out. So we were very careful to give the client not to send the wrong signals. So every time we did something, let's say, with a heightened standard, uh, we were very keen on that this was done more for the purpose of, 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 of rehabilitation than necessarily just nice to look at. So it was a balance. Uh, yeah. I hope that answers yeah. some of it. Yeah. Uh, question there and a question here. Let me check with you where you want to. Thank you. I was fascinated by the emphasis that you put on landscape, and you brought a landscape architect uh, along with you. And I've done quite a lot of work in high secure and medium secure and low secure mental health. And one of the things that uh, we have, and we have an evidence base, and you're talking about healthcare, is that having access to um, open spaces, being able to see open spaces, actually has physical effects, it lowers the blood pressure in mental health units, there's less aggression. So that we, we've, we've got a small body of evidence which is slowly being built up that this landscape element is really important. I haven't seen much of that in prison design, so I'm really interested to see whether you're collecting evidence, so, and Peter, whether you've got any particular examples of, of where landscape has made a difference to the culture of a prison. Well, I, 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 I don't, don't have evidence. I can tell you about a really interesting prison I visited in Northern Ireland called Hydebank Wood, which is built in a bit of a bowl, actually. So, again, the same issue about the perimeter wall being kind of irrelevant because it's, it's so high up you don't notice it. Um, but, but the bowl is, is grassy and, um, and there are animals that keep the grass down because it's too dangerous to mow in any other way. And the governor there uh, said it was hugely important and they are looking after young people after children as well as young adults and they talk about it. It's Hyde Bank College is what it's called, not prison. So 
that there isn't evidence, but um, I, I, I was told a very interesting fact the other day, which may, not, may or may not be true, there are people in the room who know whether this is true or not, but that um, tarmac, if you don't walk on it, disintegrates. So actually it's a very expensive thing if you don't use it, um, whereas grass doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, to answer, the, 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 are we monitoring and, and using this uh, as a, a kind of a backing in terms of investing again, in also in the, the, the asylums for, for, let's say, criminal insane and so forth? Yeah, there is a monitoring going on. But of course, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the things we introduced, uh, again, talking to in, in terms of explaining to, to the, the reasoning behind the investment, was, of course, also based on things that we knew would have a good impact. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is the sort of one thing is the sense of a space and, and it's also what you take in. So food, for instance, plays a significant role. One thing is how to do a meal, but where does things come from? Sort of this natural idea that it's just something you buy in the supermarket. And they do go to a supermarket. There's a small sort of kiosk in the, the center of the, uh, the village where you go and buy your goods. But there's also a program, and this is where we had hoped to, to sort of expand on that was to bring livestock in and give them the possibility that they could have uh, chicken and uh, sheep as we had in the rendering from the visualization from the, from the competition. And this is based on a, a project that's been running in one of the existing males, uh, jails in, in, in Denmark with a, one of these sort of star cooks from, that has a couple of restaurants. And he brought on a program where he wanted to help uh, people uh, that have been in jail and come out and work in his kitchens. And uh, there's been a dialogue now between the uh, prison system and him to see if you could sort of add the two things together so you would go full circle in a holistic approach to say that meals and a healthy body and the environment around it, if you could combine those things, this is the way <coughs> to go. So they are going to test a couple of these things within the, the jail. For the time being, livestock is off the paper, unfortunately. Uh, Peter, you, you, you were involved in a, in a prison restaurant, yes? I, I was, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, and exactly the same model. I mean, it, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? But, um, but we opened a, a very high-quality restaurant um, in the prison. It was inside the perimeter. And um, by the time I left, there were about 10,000 members of the public each year coming to eat in the restaurant. Um, and it was very important for the people who worked in there because they got skills and they got jobs but I felt it was almost more important for the 10,000 people who came in. And in the visitor's book, they talked about the food, which was fabulous, but they talked most about the service. And the service, of course, was serving prisoners and just this business of saying in the most obvious, simplest way possible, you know, a prisoner is just another human being. Um, and the only thing that you can say about prisoners as a group is that if you, if you study them as a group, you will find much higher levels of deprivation, of abuse, mm. of mental illness. Um, but that's all as a group. The individual in front of you is just another human being. I've got one question back and then back to the front. Uh, I just had a question about um, the kind of, uh, could you give like an example of how you manage the balance between not making them too comfortable, as you said, they feel like it's, they like their new home? and like kind of to dissuade them from uh, re-offending and things like that. Like, would you have any examples that have happened that dissuade them from re-offending in terms of design? Well, we don't have numbers now because it just opened like a, pretty much like a half a year ago. Um, so obviously we, we won't be able to, to prove that, that the re-offenders are gonna drop in numbers. But I think it's fair to say that, that everybody involved, and especially the client here who's been dealing with these issues, of course, he's, the whole brief is, is catering towards making sure that the surroundings and the, and, 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 and the environment we are creating, of course, should, shall we pre prepare people to get back out into society again. So I'm, I'm, I think we're pretty much convinced that there will be a drop in, 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 in in the numbers of reoffenders, and it's already out there. And, and by the way, an, another thing that's really being debated now is that have you built a prison that is going to be standing in? Because the the one-to-one -one ratio with staff, not just looking after inmates, but actually giving a sort of um, training and preparing people for getting out again, has been so successful that the overall sort of numbers uh, in the statistics in Denmark is actually 
crime has <laughs> dropped. So, of course, that is, like you said, it, it's, it, you know, of course, it's, some people would be out of uh, a job, but, <laughs> but the ultimate goal is that we don't have that much crime. And I think also technology, by the way, has helped us a lot there. A lot of people are now capable of being sort of kept at home, and I think in the future we'll see that technology comes in and plays a significant role. However, having said that you can give normalcy with technology, there's another aspect now that's really sort of mind-boggling is all the drones and so forth. So there's also been a lot of focus, that, and this has just shifted within the, the time we built this prison. So the minister that was down inaugurating the prison, he was confronted right away by journalists saying, yeah, that's all great, you put this prison out in the middle of nowhere, but what about drones that could fly in then and, and drop things down and so forth? So there's a lot of investment going into the prison now, not a lot, but there's some investment going in to create kind of a net above some of the courtyards so you can fly in mobile phones, weapons, or you can fly a person out. So, so that's one of the challenges that we were facing. I think this probably going to be our last question, because I appreciate we've kept you that long. Yeah, with just a quick question about um, what rehabilitation is actually going on. We didn't see a workshop or a kitchen or whatever. I'm just sort of interested comparatively what there actually is in there to rehabilitate yeah. through work and you know, how people make their way once they've left. There's a whole variety of spaces inside catering towards it. There's everything from carpentry workshops. There's a big laundry uh, facility. They even have a big uh, um, kitchen where they do the cooking for the staff. So the inmates actually are, are also providing the food, not just for themselves, but for the staff. And then a lot of the work that they do in the prison is not just sort of for the sake of doing something purposefully. They actually produce components for the neighboring communities building, let's say, furniture for, for the local schools and so forth. And then, of course, you have the aspects of training. So there's a lot of training facilities in there, too, on one-to-one. -to -one. Um, there's also um, a doctor's office uh, within the, the, the prison. And then, of course, there's the whole community center that they, they can attend to do sports and other recreational things. So there's a I would say the ratio is, is, is close to, to being, I wouldn't say 50-50, but it's in terms of facilities supporting this, uh, all these aspects, is quite large. Um, well, I think we should probably call it, call it close there because it's gone 8.30 and I'm sure you have uh, slightly chilly trips home. And uh, I'd just like to give a big thanks to our speakers who I think have a, been a very interesting discussion. It's a fascinating building. And in about 10, 20, 30 years' time, we'll know how it's working. So uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but seriously, fantastic.